the role. Welcome to Anamed Library Talk. At today's talk, we have distinguished speakers with us, Liv Donilon and Laura Pisano. Today's talk is entitled Archaeological Networks and Social Interaction. The book project Archaeological Networks and Social Interaction aims to improve our understanding of applications of network analysis for studying social interaction in the past. Very successful applications of network analysis exist for studying settlement archaeology and movement through the landscape, but social interactions come with their own complexities. This talk will highlight some of the discussion involved and delve deeper into a detailed case study that of Pitikusai, known by most as the first Greek colony in the West. At this point, I would like to introduce you our speakers. Lee Vedonelin graduated from Ghent University in 2000, uh, 2012 after postdoctoral positions at the University of Chicago, Göttingen and Amsterdam. She held a position as assistant professor of classical archaeology at the University of Ars before moving to lectureship at the University of Melbourne in 2020. The, she specialized in the ancient Greek colonization, Greek urban architecture, and applications of network analysis in archaeology. She currently conducts fieldwork in Italy and Greece. Laura Pisano is an archaeologist and a PhD candidate at the University of Melbourne, working on neurologic sites in Western Sardinia and interactions between Sardinian and Mediterranean cultures over the Bronze and Early Iron Age. Laura completed the School of Specialization of Archaeology, Master's and Bachelor's degree in Archaeology at the University of Cagliari. She has extensive field work experience, including at the UNESCO site of Sunnuaji in Borromini. Dear attendees, please be reminded that your video and audios are closed. Please type your questions in the chat section. Uh, your questions will be answered in Q&A session. Now I am passing the word to Laura Pisoni. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aram, and hello to everyone that is connected to this webinar today. It's a pleasure for me here as a moderator. So thank you, Aram and Liv for having me. And I'm going to be super short and I'm going to give the floor to Liv. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, and good, good evening for everyone. We are uh, talking to you from Melbourne where it's evening uh, and therefore also the awkward time for you in Turkey. Uh, because, of course, we uh, do not like to talk in the middle of the night for us, but we're absolutely happy uh, and very excited to be with you over Zoom today, uh, to be with you in Istanbul, uh, to talk about this book project, Archaeological Networks and uh, Social Interaction. Um, so this was a book project, a collaborative project that I did a, a few years ago. The idea was born a few years ago in 2017, to be more precise. Um, when after a couple of years of working with network analysis in archaeology, I became aware through discussions with colleagues that there were a number of complications and problems when we were trying to apply network analysis in archaeological uh, case studies. So what I did was um, invite a number of colleagues to come together and think about what we could do to improve, to have really a philosophical discussion, a philosophical re reflection on uh, network analysis. So those of you who have had a look at the book uh, will see that it's it's very theoretical, it's very philosophical. Honestly, I was a bit surprised <laughs> about the invitation because it's such a specialized discussion. Um, it's not easy. Uh, it's not a, a handbook, let's say, for beginners. It's really a very, very detailed uh, reflection, critical thinking about what we do as archaeologists when we start playing around with these uh, theories and methodologies of uh, network analysis. 
So, and specifically, um, the question surrounded the, the social aspect, uh, so interaction between people and exchange of objects, you know, when people trade or exchange, as often happened in the past, it's a very important aspect of our um, study of ancient societies um, to, to really understand how, how that might have happened. Uh, so what I did was ask um, Carl Nappert, who's a very distinguished professor at uh, the University of Toronto in Canada, and who has done a lot of theoretical work on uh, network analysis. Uh, I invited him to write a statement paper with some extra complications, and um, the participants in the project responded to Carl's statement paper with their own case study and thinking about the problems that um, came to the surface in this, uh, in this discussion. Of course, with the knowledge that the theoretical implications for any conclusions that we draw about the past are very important. So what I would like to talk to you about today is really an introduction to the discussion. What is network analysis and how does that function for uh, archaeologists? The theory has been uh, around in reality for a couple of decades, but it's only the last roughly 10 years that it has become more popular as, an, as a method as an application in archaeology, and with this also um, came to the fore the discussions that we are talking about um, today. So I will start with that and then move to um, asking questions about the social aspect in studying archaeology, which is also not a very evident thing to do and is something that has only developed also in the last couple of decades. So it's really uh, recent developments in theoretical archaeology that are at the core of this uh, discussion today. I will then move on to saying a few words about Carl Nappert's statement paper in the book and the relational concepts uh, that he uh, brought up in the paper and that were the complication that we were uh, thinking about. And then I will talk you through the case study that I um, wrote about in the book, uh, which is the um, site, an archaeological site called Peter Kusai, that in academic literature is known as the first Greek colony. And that's the whole discussion, how we can call it and how we can understand it. Nevertheless, I will say colony, uh, the first Greek colony in the West founded by the Greeks in the 8th century uh, before Common Era. So the idea of network is actually not, not new. Uh, the word network has been around in, in ancient Greek, in ancient in Latin. So we know that even in antiquity, people had the concept of a network of things being connected to each other through uh, lines essentially forming a bigger whole, a bigger unity, let's say. And through uh, Latin and French, uh, this concept came into the modern languages and we see that different languages have different words for, for it. Réseau in French, network in English, Knotenpunkt uh, in German, but essentially the idea is the same and exists uh, really throughout, uh, throughout cultures. It's a transcultural uh, concept. And it was only in uh, early modern times as so the development of the, um, of the sciences, 17th, 18th century, a, um, actually a Swiss scholar who moved to Russia uh, who actually developed the idea, the mathematical idea, of talking about a network, a system of connections, and uh, he came up with the idea to represent it as points, dots, and lines 
as a visual representation of, uh, of the problem. And what happened, actually, there's an anecdote which is interesting, which is a bit funny, uh, so I'll share it with you. Um, what happened is that in this society, and you know, we're talking about 17th, 18th century bourgeois society, even in Russia. Uh, so people went for walks, they put on their nice clothes, they went for walks through the town, and the city of Kaliningrad had seven bridges crossing the river. And people, apparently, according to the anecdote, had a game to try to walk through town and cross all the bridges only once, trying to do that. And the game was really, is this possible? So people were trying all kinds of configurations to do this. And the mathematician, Erler, he um, actually came up with a solution to, to approach this as a mathematical problem. He drew it as lines and dots and actually solved the problem, coming to the conclusion that no, it's not possible uh, to do this. You cannot cross seven bridges um, by only crossing them once or go through town by crossing the seven bridges uh, only once. And Euler was a famous mathematician, so he wrote about it, a, a theoretical uh, essay, and through that, through this invention, uh, this very banal um, occupation of the elite in uh, Kaliningrad, we um, have inherited the scientific concept of, uh, of networks. Now, through uh, earlier networks and graph theory, as it um, um, became known, was developed into a very complex series of um, uh, statements, which I'm not going to elaborate on. Uh, I'm not a mathematician. Actually, I was very bad at mathematics at school, I have to confess. Uh, but just know that behind everything that I'm going to talk about today, the uh, sociological applications, the archaeological applications, in reality, there's a lot of mathe math uh, math mathematical as well as uh, physics uh, and theory around that uh, have been developed and that eventually have created the software programs uh, that archaeologists use to do network analysis. Um, actually, already um, in the 19th and early 20th century, sociologists uh, also started talking about networks, thinking about networks, but without this mathematical application that Euler and uh, successive mathematicians developed. And a very famous figure is uh, called Georg Simmel, a German sociologist who already in the early days, so he's one of the first sociologists, one of the first theories, uh, theorists of sociology that we have. He already in these early days said that People as individuals can only be understood when you look at their social network. So he says uh, family relations are important to understand people. Their friendship relations are important to understand people. So you cannot look at people and understand them in isolation as individuals. And this is, of course, very important when you start talking about past societies, as we archaeologists and historians do, to keep that in mind. Very often we forget about this social dimension. And probably the first, at least to the best of my knowledge, the very first really um, application of something that looks a bit mathematical uh, in terms of network analysis is this table that you see on the slide and that was produced by a research group of American scholars from the University of, uh, of Chicago who went to the very south of the United States to look at uh, class relationships and also racial relationships between African Americans and uh, white Americans. And they wanted to understand what people did and how people became 
uh, let's say, essentially the people they were and the kind of objects they consumed and how that was brought about by their relationship. So essentially this idea from Zimmel, but applied in a fieldwork study, in a case study uh, that they did by conducting uh, research on what individuals in this, uh, in this society uh, did. So essentially the table on the slide is uh, a group of uh, high class, social, high social class ladies in this society, and we're talking about the 1940s in the United States, who uh, attended um, social events, so parties or um, welfare gatherings, um, and they looked at who attended when and came to the conclusion that ladies who attended uh, the same events more often were actually closer, tighter as, uh, as a relationship. So that shows that there are all kinds of dynamics going on in society, in interaction between people that are important to understand the way people behave. A, another early uh, theorist who actually applied the concept of lines and dots to represent social interactions was um, another American from Italian descent, uh, Jacopo Moreno, who made a study of um, essentially, a, um, it was not a boarding school, it was actually a sort of prison uh, for young girls in uh, New York, in Upper State New York, uh, where they had an, a sort, sort of epidemic of the girls running away from, uh, from the school. And Moreno decided to look at the girls and who ran away and discover that actually these relationships were important in understanding and predicting actually which girls would run away. So it shows that the relationships, and he drew this uh, with this diagram, that people who knew each other better, who were closer friends, actually displayed uh, the same uh, the same behavior. And then uh, from that, the, so the application, the social application of network analysis became important, became commonplace, and um, essentially to the point that it is almost common knowledge, I would say, in uh, in our westernized world to, to say things like the small world problem or the world is a global village uh, and so on. Um, and it has been proven uh, by, uh, for example, this, this study in the 1960s uh, by um, Milgram, who said that every person in, in the world I will say at least in, in the modern world, I'm not talking about the tribes in the Amazon who have not been contacted, of course, but everyone in, in, in our uh, world is on average only six people removed from another person. So the, the experiment that they conducted was that they gave people a letter that they had to send to another person and they didn't know that person. So they could only send a letter by giving it to someone they knew and they thought would maybe know that person. And they discovered that on average, it only took six people to get a letter to its uh, destination. And from that, you know, again, all kinds of jokes and games arose. And a very famous one is uh, one that is called The Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. Uh, Kevin Bacon is a famous Hollywood actor. And uh, the game is essentially to name any one Hollywood actor and see how many steps removed he is from Kevin Bacon. And then they've discovered that also effectively this uh, rule of six steps of separ separation is actually true also for Kevin Bacon. So any actor is essentially very closely related. If you apply these ideas to um, the modern world or even the past, you see that um, the kind of networks that people live in are very important for our interpretations um, of past or even present societies. Um, important is also the development of uh, weak ties that some of you might have heard because it has been applied 
uh, in certain archaeological contexts, one that I will talk about uh, at a later point. Um, so this case study was important. It was conducted in the 1970s by a scholar who essentially claimed that um, any one person in this context in the United States who was looking for a job was uh, better off by getting information from people they did not know that well. So it, again, this idea of your close network, these people share the, sh the same ideas, they share the same information. And if you want to get new information, like for exa example, where there is a job opportunity, you are better off with contacting someone who is not part of your close network of people who have the same information already. And today, these concepts are so important, they're so general that they are applied in um, studies on voting, in uh, studies of health, uh, for example, uh, to, to talk about recent health situations, vaccination campaigns, uh, instead of distributing uh, or trying to distribute vaccines uh, just uniformly in a society, they've discovered that it's better to target what we would understand an influencer, someone who is very important, who has a very big network. Uh, if you target that person and are successful in convincing that person, that person who has a big network will distribute the information through, uh, through the network. So it's commonly applied in biology, um, in sociology, in mathematics, so networks, concept of networks are really everywhere. Now, where stands archaeology in this um, discussion? So what we see is that archaeologists were actually pretty early with picking up the concept and already in the 1960s, we have someone conducting a study of um, actually the development of trade in medieval Russia. So the scholar took um, the network of rivers, plotted the cities along the network of rivers to see how, how the whole, how the entirety of this network could explain the rise of uh, Russia as, uh, as a network. And then it appears that the important cities are also located along the rivers in at important nodes, really, in the physical landscape. Pardon. Um, other other um, studies have been conducted with a similar idea in mind. And another early example is uh, one study that was conducted about the Romans in Britain, um, where effectively also the settlement pattern could, uh, rep could be represented really as a network. And there you see that the cities who are located on a critical part of the network were also important cities. So the physical location and the relationship between the units of the network uh, were discovered to be very, very important and could explain phenomena of development in the past. A first application really to look at interaction between people. So previously they were talking about cities or settlements and their location in a physical landscape. Um, in the 1970s, there was also someone who made experiments to see how network analysis would function if you would talk about um, cultural practices uh, like pottery uh, production or bur burial rites and so on. So this scholar Terrell applied uh, the idea, it's called um, proximal point analysis. So within the network, you make ties to the first neighbor who has similar uh, behavior. And he came up, this was in Melanesia, so actually our side of the world. Um, he made this um, network with lines representing similarities with the closest neighbor to see, to try to explain how uh, cultural change really uh, functions, how similarities uh, between different regions would 
function. Um, some other scholars have also tried to use network theories. Uh, for example, uh, Colin Renfrew, a very famous British archaeologist who was very important in developing all kinds of theories. Uh, he mostly works, some of you might be familiar with his work, on um, the prehistoric Aegean uh, Cycladic uh, culture uh, and so on. And you see that they spoke about um, ideas that we still use today in archaeology, for example, uh, the Thesan uh, polygons, so uh, a central sediment, and then you try to uh, estimate, uh, it's a theoretical calculation essentially, uh, based on the location of the center, you try to estimate where the borders of the uh, um, region or of the, the territory of a settlement uh, are. And using that, using this idea, they also try to apply it as a network to see how different societies, different uh, settlements within the society would have uh, interacted with each other, would have functioned, and which settlement could be explained as being the most important, the capital or the central settlement. So it's very much this idea of hierarchy between uh, settlements. Um, they uh, applied it, so they made all kinds of uh, complex tables and models, and uh, from this came also the uh, concept of peer polity interaction that some of you might be familiar with in um, archaeological discussions. And you see that these uh, methods were picked up, so there was actually some rupture between the studies, those of the 1960s, 1970s, we have a few studies in the 1980s, but then in the 1990s, it just dropped out of fashion. And for some years, there was absolutely no application of uh, network theory. There was no theoretical discussion. Archaeologists simply dropped the idea because they were not entirely satisfied with the interpretations that uh, came from it. And then you see that roughly in 2010, 2012, it was born again, it was rediscovered, and it made its way again into uh, archaeological research in different periods and uh, different times. And uh, one example here that I show you on the slide is actually some of the work that was conducted by the research group uh, around Carl Nappert, so our um, keynotes, our respondent for the book project, um, who made studies about uh, the trade relationships between Crete, uh, the islands, and also the coast, uh, coastal cities of Anatolia that we know, of course, in the Bronze Age had very important networks of interaction and exchange. Now, what they did was a theoretical application, a model uh, based on proximal point analysis. So they drew lines between whom they knew were closest neighbors to see who was more important. And they also tried to account for the eruption of the Thera volcano that we know around um, um, 1600 BCE blows up this big volcano and disrupts effectively. We have archaeological testimonies that show that there was disruption in Crete and on some of the islands uh, as a consequence of this uh, huge volcano uh, eruption. So the trade routes were reconfigured but uh, still existed. Um, some other recent applications of network theory in archaeology uh, are visibility networks that, again, um, I imagine some of you uh, today with us are familiar with. It's the idea of uh, trying to see which settlement or which site is most important in a network of inter-visibility. Uh, that has found several applications, uh, for example, just one um, example that I show you on the slide by um, my colleague, uh, actually fellow Belgian, um, we, we were born in the same city even, <laughs> um, 
uh, a, a research project that uh, that he did. Uh, it also found application in uh, Italy, where important research was done on the rise of the city of Rome and the Etruscan cities to see how their location within a, a physical geographical network could be uh, explained. And then again, you know, I just show you some of the most important uh, examples, very good case studies. So maybe some of you might be inspired uh, to go into more detail um, in the questions. It might be um, good points of departure for uh, future uh, research. So another project that was done uh, by some former colleagues of mine at the University of Amsterdam who were studying the Limes, the frontier zone of the Romans up in uh, through the Netherlands and uh, Germany to see how the settlements uh, developed. So they tried to make predictions of archaeological sites that were not found, but based on a theoretical network um, of, of roads, and rivers, they try to predict where settlements would have been within this uh, system of exploitation, essentially. Uh, so they try to look at how far people could walk, for example, if they were trying to carry grain from one place to another, uh, or if they had a, an oxen chart to carry the load of grain, how far they would have been able to travel before, theoretically, they would need probably a place for the night and water to uh, give to the animals and food to give to the animals to allow them to travel further on to supply grain to um, the, um, let's say, fortification of the Romans along the Lima. So very, very good idea, really thinking, because sometimes we don't have the archaeological remains and we have to resort to this kind of theoretical assumptions about where settlements could have been. However, these are very interesting applications, but there are a number of complications, a number of problems really that uh, come with it. In the sense that these studies talk about geographical space, um, about settlements, but not so much about the people. And I've just explained that sociologists have said that, you know, people are important. You can only understand people if you look at their networks. So this dimension up until that point in time when we had this discussion was actually largely absent in the study of network uh, analysis. And there's an irony to it, given the history of network analysis as or network thinking as a sociological uh, problem. Um, so what people were risking to do is go back to the cultural historical paradigm where set, you know, once society Greeks did like this or the Romans did like that or the Hittites uh, to stay within Anatolia, the Hittites did so. Of course, we know that the past was much more complex. So the problem is how can we represent that in network, uh, network analysis? So the social dimension has been only part of archeological thinking in the last couple, uh, couple of decades. When we go back in time, a lot of archaeological studies, and I have to say some colleagues still study past societies like this, they talk about cultures as something coherent, where everyone has the same beliefs, everyone has the same practices, everyone uses the same pottery, everyone dresses the same uh, in the same clothes, and so on. And of course, we know that that is not realistic. There are a lot of nuances, especially in places where different cultures meet, and that is simply not taken into account in studies that are just very general and take very large regions and long periods of time into uh, consideration in their study. Now, things started to change when uh, archaeologists started to adopt methods that we call um, uh, processualism, the paradigm of processualism uh, that we know 
developed when archaeologists started conducting archaeological surveys. And, and through the surveys, through the uh, larger amount of settlements that were discovered, archaeologists, or at least some archaeologists, started to think in more complex ways about interaction between different settlements, between different parts of, um, of a cultural uh, system. But it took actually until the early 1990s with the famous work of uh, Ian Hodder, a, a British archaeologist who um, has gone to Stanford University in the United States, has been there for uh, many years. And he was really at the forefront to think about um, identity of people and the way that people use objects to express an identity. So here we see for the first time in archaeology, and it's shocking that you know this happened in the 1990s. Most of us will have been alive in the 1990s. It's not that long ago. It's a you know, uh, so it's shocking that it took so long really for archaeologists to start thinking critically about um, human beings in the past and think that these people were not actually so different from you and I uh, today. We have different technologies today, but um, in the past people were as intelligent, as complex as uh, people are today. Um, and here we see that effectively within this uh, within this framework, some books were published really about you know how how as archaeologists can we understand individual human beings within their social circle, and how can we study the way that they used objects to express identity, which is not so easy because of course it's in, in most cases, in some cases it is written on the object, but in most cases it is not written on the object, what it is uh, meant to be or how it was important for one person or how it might have been used in interaction in, in really daily, um, daily life. Um, and very recently, the last couple of years, uh, people really start even pushing these theoretical assumptions further in a, um, um, let's say, group of theories that we call new materialism. Uh, and some of you might be familiar with the French word, the chaîne opératoire, uh, the um, process that we use, or uh, let's say the process, we call it a process to transform materials from one material into another. So the whole operation, for example, to make pottery, you would look at the clay and then look at all the kinds of transformations that a potter would make to make the pot. And then you look at the consumption patterns and the patterns of discarding and then the afterlife as the object enters our present day society and becomes, in most cases, a, a piece of a display in a museum. All these processes in reality are important to understand uh, objects. Now, this of course creates problems because if we are talking about people, where are we going to locate the interaction? Um, can, we, can we talk about regions? If we really want to understand past societies, can we talk, can we say something about in Anatolia, this happened, or in ancient Greece, that happened? Is that even possible? Is that a valid philosophical statement? Is that, is that possible? Um, so the questions we have to ask, and these were the questions that were really at the core of the book project, to which the various participants uh, responded with their own experience and their own archaeological case study to see to what extent it was possible to answer uh, these questions. So what are actors? Uh, are they necessarily human or do we also have to devote more attention to objects? Um, uh, what, do, what do actors do and to what extent can we understand behavior of actors in the past and can we model that in network analysis um, and you know how do we generalize how what valid generalizations can we make as archaeologists uh, so Carl Nappert uh, looked at 
the work of a couple of anthropologists, uh, essentially, to claim that actually to complicate the matter even further. So I had raised these questions about geography and Carl says, oh, I have some more problems when we talk about network analysis, when we talk about interaction between people. And he was looking specifically at exchange. Because, of course, archaeologists in past societies, whether we're talking about the Neolithic, about the Bronze Age, Iron Age or historical periods, um, we talk about societies that exchange objects, they exchange raw materials like metals, uh, they exchange luxury objects. And we think very often in modern ways, in the sense that someone gave someone an object and the other person took money, which is, of course, the uh, very Western, very modern concept of market exchange. One person gets the money, the other person gets the object, and the deal is done. Um, and Carl Nappert very rightly raised the issue that um, actually in many, many societies, non-Western societies, in past societies, relationships between people with objects were more complex in the sense that there were dependencies created when someone uh, gave an object to another person. Now, this was initially an idea that was uh, developed by an anthropologist, um, by a couple of anthropologists looking at exchange in uh, Melanesian uh, society. So again, the side of Australia, uh, usually Papua New Guinea was very popular as a setting for fieldwork uh, studies. Um, and they looked at, uh, let's say, the depths that were generated or the acknowledgement of women uh, in, in one of the specific case studies that was uh, looked at by Alfred Gell um, and hence also the uh, drawing on the slide um, that the exchange of pigs, which was very important in this society, uh, was simply not a market exchange, but came with all kinds of uh, implication. So when people gave an object to another person, they actually gave a part of uh, themselves. So it was definitely not market exchange uh, and uh, really a, a, a huge complication if we accept that this kind of issues also existed in the past. And Carl Neppert actually came with a couple of examples from the past from which it becomes clear that effectively the exchange of objects in many cases was not a market exchange, but the objects accumulated value based on the previous owner of the object. And the most famous example that Carl Nappert uh, cites is um, uh, references in Homer when he talks about you know these Greek heroes who have objects, and when they have objects, they actually say, oh, but this object was owned by this person before me, and it was more valuable simply because that famous hero had owned the object before them. So you see that objects accumulate value within the networks of people that had used them. Now, in the case of Homer, we have a written discussion about the kind of values that were attributed to objects. But as archaeologists, when we are digging in the field and we find objects, we have no clue about the values that might have been attached to these objects. So it's very difficult to um, come up with a solution. However, Knowing that this might have been the case, we have to think about it. We have to take that uh, into, um, into account. So this was essentially the challenge that Carl Nappert uh, put for us, which was a very, very difficult one. Uh, so we all um, took a lot of time to think. Um, and I have to say, that I find the, the studies that are in the book really uh, fantastic because everyone accepted the challenge and with different examples really looked at how far we can push our reasoning 
about interaction and the use of objects and the meaning of object in the cre creation of relationships between people in, um, in the past. I am not going to talk about all of the individual um, case studies that are in the book. I still want you <laughs> to have something to read. Um, and also I, I can't possibly correctly represent all the complexities of the studies uh, that are there. Uh, for those who haven't had a look at the book yet, um, there's a case study about the Vikings about uh, Native American cultures, uh, Central European uh, cultures. Uh, there's a case study about Pompeii, uh, Iron Age, uh, Italy. So very, very interesting, different cultural um, complexes that in different ways allow us to understand interaction um, in the past. Now, I want to devote my um, last, let's say, 10-15 minutes to a discussion uh, about a case study that I am most familiar with, uh, which is a um, case study linked to the phenomenon of Greek uh, colonization. So the application of network concepts to study ancient Greek colonization are not new when I came to it. Because in 2011, Irat um, Malkin, a very distinguished uh, scholar, historian, used network theory to talk about uh, the ancient Greek world and specifically the spread of Greek culture throughout uh, the Mediterranean and, uh, and the Black Sea. So he used specifically the concept of uh, the small world and you remember that I spoke about it earlier, uh, this idea that everything is connected to everyone. And he essentially said that um, certain locations like uh, the sanctuary at Olympia, uh, where the Olympic Games were, and the sanctuary at Delphi, where the famous oracle uh, of Delphi resided, uh, he claimed that these were central nodes in the network and that because of everyone, all the Greeks interacting through this network and meeting each other at the central nodes, the ancient Greek culture was to be understood as a small world network. Now, it is a very well written book. Um, it's um, thought provoking. I know Irat very well, and he knows I disagree with his uh, <laughs> with his conclusions. I think, and I'm not the only person who thinks that there are a number of problems in the interpretations um, presented in this book. Uh, and essentially, the big problem is the presence of indigenous populations that we know existed are not included in the conclusions. Um, yet we have the archaeological evidence for them. So there is a problem really in how um, this network theoretical concept was applied into the interpretation of this uh, society. Now, I um, was very interested in this uh, site. You see it here on the map. I don't know if you can see, uh, can see my arrow on the slide. So located here, um, roughly in the center south of Italy in the Bay of Naples is this island which is today Ischia. It's a very beautiful place. If you have the opportunity you should definitely go and visit. Um, and in Ischia um, archaeologists have conducted excavations in the 1950s, 1960s. They found hundreds of tombs with objects and um, there were problems of interpretation because ancient sources, and most notably uh, Strabo, says explicitly that um, Peter Kusai, as well as um, another city that was here, uh, just located on the mainland opposite of uh, Peter Kusai, the site called Kuma. Uh, Peter Kusai and Kuma, according to Strabo, he says explicitly, they were the first Greek cities in Italy. Now, scholars have believed this for a long time. They took Strabo at face value. They believed his words literally, and they always said, oh, Peter Kusai and Kuma 
are the first Greek cities in, um, in Italy. But then these excavations started yielding results. What did the archaeologists find in the tombs? Greek pottery, yes, but also a lot of objects that were absolutely not Greek. Um, objects, uh, fibuli, jewelry, like bracelets, um, pendants that were clearly related to the indigenous cultures that were better known on the mainland, as well as pottery, the example on the slide here with the spirals uh, from um, uh, the area around Lazio, um, but also objects from uh, Egyptian faience. Uh, Pseudo-Egyptian scarabs that were probably produced on uh, Rhodos, on the island of Rhodos. Um, Fibuli from Anatolia, from Iberia. So showing that there was a material culture in this so-called first colony that was not Greek. So how do we explain that? And there have been discussions for many decades, really, uh, since, since the excavations took place. And everyone always kept talking about, oh, this is a Greek colony and it is the first Greek colony uh, and so on. And I was very intrigued by this problem. And uh, I decided to apply a quantitative study using the method of network analysis to better understand the dynamics of this uh, society and hopefully understand better the cultural affiliation um, of this society. Uh, so I used the idea of the uh, early sociological studies and tried to apply it to an archaeological case study. Now, in practice, uh, I did this by making an access database and I took the big publication, it's published like a big book, uh, and for every tomb, I made a uh, file with all the uh, details in it that would allow me afterwards to export this information to a software that makes essentially these graphs uh, for you. And there are plenty of software programs available now. Most of them are for free. So you can make very nice graphs once you have the information written in the right format to export it to, um, to the network analysis software. Now, unique in Pitakusai is that we have the stratigraphic information of the tombs as well as the spatial relationships. So we can, with um, quite some confidence, say that people who are buried in plots, in the family plots, were um, family or at least related, a unit, a social unit, um, and we can look at the transformation over time, which is pretty unique. It's really from uh, this culture, this period, this culture, one of the best understood, one of the best published, necropolis, uh, and therefore it allows for a detailed analysis that in other cases is simply not possible. So in first instance, I looked only at um, cultural affiliations. It's a previous study uh, I conducted, published in 2016. And my conclusion actually from, um, uh, from this analysis was that actually we should look at this so-called first Greek colony as primarily an indigenous society. The most important affiliation of the material culture is the indigenous uh, culture. And now it is still unpublished, but a couple of years ago, a um, bioarchaeological research was conducted on a number of the skeletons. And it seems actually I'm very pleased that I was right because bioarchaeological research has uh, actually confirmed now that the vast majority of the people in Pitakusai, at least the ones that they were able to study, uh, appear to have, um, um, let's say, a biological ancestry of Italy, the region of Italy, the regions around Italy, and only a small part of these people came from somewhere else. And that is really revolutionary in our interpretation of um, Greek colonization. It means that actually Greek colonization was not so very Greek. It was also not a colonization. Um, I used in another study 
uh, the chronology to look at the development. And again, out of this came very clearly over time that especially in the earlier phases, uh, there was the um, primary affiliation of indigenous population in this um, in the material culture, at least, and only at later stages did um, Greek material culture and influence become more important. And then specifically, the ancient city of Corinth was the most important affiliation. Now, for the book project, um, Archaeological Networks and Social Interaction, I decided to select a couple of objects and look at the way they were deposited in these family complexes over time. Um, I'm not going to go through um, the development in, in the different times. I, it would take too long, and you can read it in, in the book uh, if you like. Um, but what the analysis showed for the objects that um, I uh, studied, uh, showed a, a very, um, let's say, different pattern of distribution and circulation than what we would normally expect. The traditional assumption was that, ha, in a very cultural historical fashion, the population in Pitakusa used oinochoe, so wine jugs and drinking cups in the burial rites. And what my analysis showed was that, no, not everyone was buried with drinking cups or oinochoe or aribaloi, so the perfume flasks, in a uniform fashion, which means that there were certain manipulations going on in uh, the deposition. So during burial, some people had more access to certain goods than others. Um, I looked um, in first instance at the distribution patterns of drinking cups, the wine drinking cups. So we have different typologies, uh, skiphoi, kotilai, and so on. Some were locally produced, some were imported. And it very much showed that there were certain family groups who clearly manipulated the circulation and really kept the circulation of these objects to themselves. And referring back to Carl Nappert's idea of sticky exchange and objects with complications, this is an example where we can say that given the limited access to these objects, by the vast majority of the population, we can imagine that these objects were considered sacred and special in this society. Now, if we look at the distribution of oinochoe, so the wine jugs and um, general jugs, we see that actually it has a different deposition pattern than the wine drinking cups, which is very interesting. You wouldn't you wouldn't think about it, you wouldn't come up unless you started looking uh, at that. So um, with the with oinochoe, we could see that actually more people used the oinochoe, not everyone still, but it seems that it was more common to have an oinochoe than it was to have drinking cups, which doesn't make sense if you have the traditional assumption that everyone should have an oinochoe in a drinking cup. So. Um, this seems to show that the act of libation, um, and they think that they poured wine to extinguish the cremation pyre, uh, that this was a very common thing uh, to do, more common than using the cup to consume some wine uh, during the burial rites. And then if we look at the distribution of uh, lekitoi, uh, in Aribaloi, so these are containers that were used for oil. Uh, we again see another pattern of deposition through time and one that emphasizes uh, quantity. Uh, so people, for some reason, seem to think that it is important not to uh, put one Aribalos or one Lekitos in a tomb, but put three, four, five, six um, or more in a tomb. So that shows that these objects have a different uh, meaning and a different value if you compare them to um, the other objects. 
Now, if you look at the family groups who are doing all, all, all these things, it becomes very clear that over time, there are a certain number of families within this society who are more important and who control the circulation of the drinking cups, who control the circulation of the oinochoe, and who are the ones who have more perfume, which was expensive, who have more costly perfume bottles to deposit. So that shows that there are certain families in the society who are developing into an elite and controlling the uh, interaction and exchange networks that existed. Now, not in the uh, book project, um, but in another uh, publication, I continued actually this uh, analysis and I looked at the amphorae uh, which were uh, produced to store wine uh, because I wanted to understand the relationship with the deposition patterns that I had just uh, discovered. Um, I did some typological analysis which ha had not been done. I will not go into details either, uh, because again, that would be um, too long if we were to talk about this. But I only want to say that also the amphorae demonstrate that in their deposition, they were being manipulated by the same families that were manipulating the use of, um, of the other projects, uh, of the other objects. So within this um, small research project, I was able to draw uh, a number of, I think, very interesting conclusions, being that objects were not deposited in uniform fashion within, uh, within this society, but there was a variation through time and also through between the different um, agents, the different participants in this, uh, in this society. Um, I've also, in, 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 in the literature, uh, if you're interested, you can read more in more detail in the, in the text. I've linked this to the appearance also of a market economy. So tying back to Carl Nappert's discussion of the kind of relationships that are forged between people when they exchange objects, the changes I have discovered through time seem to indicate that some of these relationships break down and that there might be a move towards market economy and commodification of uh, labor and goods. Exactly because of the enlargement of the chain operatoire. So when you install the, a wine industry that needs the amphorae, that needs the collection of natural resources to develop into wine and the people you need, you see that an exchange system arises within this society in which it appears to become possible to pay someone probably with an amphorae of wine. So someone would come in to work for you um, or and, and you would pay them, for example, in wine or in uh, foreign goods. So it's a completely different um, exchange relationship that rises. And we can say that this is the consequence of the increased interaction within the Aegean, the phenomenon that we usually call colonization, that increasingly we understand is a much more um, complex network. We use the word globalization even to describe it. Very complex exchange interactions between the different parts of the Mediterranean, of Anatolia, and gradually also of uh, the Black Sea, of course. So overall, um, to look back at a, uh, at a book project, we've, um, we've passed the hour, so I'm, I'm going to uh, wrap up. Um, with with some general conclusions before I open up the floor, uh, or Laura better will open up the floor for you for questions, if you have questions about this. Um, so can we use network analysis to represent social interaction? Can we include human agency um, into our discussions by using network analysis? I think we can say that yes. In some cases, it is possible um, by looking at the depositional patterns uh, of objects, we are able to distinguish certain human behaviors that previously we did not know. And if you read the book, 
you will also see that the other case studies are also able, through the use of network analysis and network concepts, to come up or discover certain behavioral patterns that give agency to that that make our interpretation of um, these past societies more complex to problematize really uh, the way we think about uh, about past societies. Nevertheless, I'm going to say that there are still limits, so it's not a method that is going to solve every problem um, that we have when we are trying to make interpretations about past societies, and, and most notably things like daily life, um, or really the day-to-day -day interaction and exchanges between people will still remain uh, very, uh, very problematic. So we can never only rely on, uh, on the diagrams, uh, but always have to have a philosophical reflection really on what we are trying uh, to achieve. That was it for me uh, for today. Um, I hope this was interesting and I'm very happy to take any kind of uh, questions or discussion uh, that you would like to have. Thank you very much, Liv. That was amazing. A great talk and that opens like so many questions. I'd love to ask you so many questions and to share with you so many thoughts. And I, I guess that all our attendees are going to have like so many questions to ask to you. So I really encourage all of them to use the chat to write the questions that I'm going to read to leave so she can answer uh, to all of them. And in the meantime, that uh, we are waiting for people to write. I'm going to break the ice if it's OK also with um, Hiram and with you, Liv. So yeah. you you say that uh, there were like imports from Greece and I understood correctly also from Italy in Pitikusai in the tombs. Yeah. So I was wondering, they were like present like contemporary in the same tombs, both like the Greeks and the imported like Italians, let's say imports and what can we like understand or from networks like there is any yeah yeah that is a, that is a good question and that was exactly the problem because it's all mixed so you see that all the tombs have a mix of objects. So there's no single tomb that has only Greek objects or has only indigenous objects, because then it would be easy to say, oh, this is a Greek person, this is an indigenous person. But with everything being so mixed, so tombs have Greek drinking cups, uh, the amphorae, the local amphorae production was based on Phoenician models. So they would have Greek drinking cups, Phoenician amphorae, Egyptian scarabs, um, you know, other yeah. faience objects. I just say something. Uh, everything, everything was mixed, so it's impossible really to uh, to separate. Now, if uh, you use network analysis, you are able to make an analysis of literally hundreds or even thousands of objects at the same time. And that is, I think, the strength of uh, the method that the human brain cannot possibly, you know, understand. Yeah, yeah. When you look through a publication with hundreds of objects, the human brain cannot digest so much information. A computer can. So if you insert this information into a computer, the computer is going to make a nice diagram for you and is going to say, oh, the vast majority of the objects, which I did, the vast majority actually of the objects and the material features like the tomb construction is of indigenous origin and you have so many percentage of Corinthian origin, uh, so many percentage uh, of Cypriot origin. Uh, so that allows you to have a quantitative understanding of deposition patterns. Yeah, that, that's great. The yes, yes, it answer, it answer, and it's also I think uh, a way that is uh, easy to like visualize 
this complex network. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is. Yeah. I think one of the strengths of network analysis is the visual aspect, and there's more and more software available to make all kinds of graphs. And you can manipulate them so you can extract information, uh, you can remove certain informations to really analyze um, your data set in a different way. That's super fascinating. We have a question from the chat, Liv. So let's say, it's, by looking at the network ties, can we tell the difference between a market and a gift economy and make any assumptions? Would they look different? Um, yes, actually, scholars have made assumptions or have, have uh, said that when you look at a market economy, objects are distributed in a more uniform matter, in a more uniform way, because the rationale of a market economy is that everyone has, everyone who has money has access to the objects. Whereas in a sacred economy or in a moral economy, you see that only the elite has access uh, to these objects. So in that way, you can, you can distinguish. So if you see that there are manipulations going on and only few people have access to certain objects, it is probably uh, because of some kind of um, moral, um, moral economy, moral sacred assumption that is attached to the objects. More questions from the attendees? Any curiosity? Any thoughts that you'd like to share with Liv? This is a really great occasion because we have here Liv to, to ask uh, yeah. all the questions I will about say, connectivity. I will say that people are also very welcome to send me an email. Um, if you come up with a question or you would like to have a, a longer discussion, I'm more than happy to uh, respond to emails uh, as well. That's nice. And we have another question. So if we conduct the analysis on a large scale, such as across regions, at what point should we, should we be careful when drawing inferences from the network analysis? Huh. That is a very good question. Um, I think the quality of your interpretation will depend on the quality of your data set. If you have a very big data set, and increasingly archaeologists have big data sets, so our interpretations will become better over time. But if you have a very detailed data set, let's say, you know, from, I think tombs are really the best context to study because they are a unified deposit in most cases, at least when they are individual tombs. Um, in that case, you will be able to come up with a reconstruction that is at least valid for the material that you have. Um, if you have only a few data sets available and you're talking about very large regions, you can still do it, but you have to be aware that you are making assumptions and you are generalizing a lot. If you don't have all the information that is included, like all the excavation reports and so on, if you have not included that in your data set, you know, I'm going to say your conclusion is more going to be a hypothesis than a, a real conclusion. A possible solution for that could be to, um, well, make what they call a null hypothesis. So network software will allow you to uh, create a random graph and that is really made random by, by the system. Uh, and if that pattern of the random graph looks the same as the network you have made that shows that your network is probably random and has no validity, um, no, you know, there's no actual network pattern, deposition pattern um, that is at, at play there. If, however, your network pattern looks very different from the random pattern, you can say that 
with some probability, there is a chance that there were certain things going on within your network that result in the um, depositional pattern that, um, that you have. Thank you so for I your answer, Liz. I think so. <laughs> and thank you for that. And we have another message in the chat that has both a comment and a question. And it says, this is amazing. Thank you. I'm a big fan of network analysis. However, I wonder if statistical analysis could provide similar results for some of the case studies you have presented, aside from illustrating the relationships among the nodes. That is absolutely true. Um, network analysis is a statistical method. Uh, so if the results would be very different from other statistical uh, methods, there would be a problem. <laughs> it would not be valid. Uh, I think the advantage personally for me for using network analysis and not statistical methods is that actually network analysis is pretty easy to use. So when you have a database, you can just extract the information and put it into the database for the software of the network analysis, and it makes these beautiful graphs. Uh, I'm going to say that I know several people who know uh, how to code, for example, R uh, or Python, uh, and they are able to create um, their own patterns, their own networks by, uh, by coding. I'm going to be honest, I don't know how to code. I've tried to learn that and I thought it was terribly boring, <laughs> so I gave up. So I'm going to leave the development of uh, codes to other people and I will just use uh, the other network analysis. It really depends on the skills you have and the, the software you have at, um, uh, at hand. So if you're very good in statistics, absolutely you can use the same methods to come to similar results. Thank you, Liv. Any further questions from the attendees? I think that someone is typing, so maybe we can have other questions in that is like tonight it's also we are talking about networking and this is a network that was created by Hiram uh, asking Liv to come and talk with us me to be the moderator and we are all linked uh, like thanks to the web in this yeah, online exactly. network so when you start thinking about it side. networks are, networks are everywhere Yes. Okay, I think that we don't have any more questions, but thank you very much, Liv. Thank you, Laura, for joining me here. A pleasure. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Uh, and thank you the attendees for the contributions with their questions. Uh, Animate Library Talk will continue in November. You can follow the details in our website and social media accounts. Uh, thank you very much again and uh, see you in our next Animate Library Talk. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.